Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Caroline Daniel, and as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm English, and also ruining, like Edward Luce, the rather strange events back in London. Um, the worst of which is I've never gambled in my life. And ahead of the election last week, a senior banker said to me, go on, Caroline, you're going to make a lot of money in this election. And he advised me to uh, bet on a large conservative majority. And being a member of the cultural elite and obviously completely disconnected from my country, I put some money down and I've lost it all. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the gambler I should be paying attention to on this table when I introduce him in a moment is Steve Levitt, who is a famous poker champion. So maybe I should have been listening to him on gambling. <laughs> um, so we have a great panel, in fact, it's not just a great panel, it's also a very big panel, the biggest of the conference, and so we have a lot to get through. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly introduce some of the panellists. So on my left I have Gerald Lawless, who is Chairman of the World Travel and Tourism Council and Head of Hospitality and Tourism at Dubai Holdings. And he famously ran the Jumeirah Group of Hotels for 18 years, expanding it to 22 hotels and 11 destinations, and establishing the Burj Al Arab Jumeirah Hotel is the most luxurious in the world, including an underwater dining room, which you could access by a simulated submarine voyage. Believe that or not. <laughs> it's true, you can Google it. Not that that's always true. Um, and then to our, our left is uh, Linda Joja, who's Executive VP of United Airlines and also its Chief Information Officer. She's been there for the last two and a half years. And she's also successfully the winner of the recent Chicago CIO of the Year Award, so congratulations on that. And uh, she felt rather guilty because she's building a house, and I said, where? And alas, it's in the woods, not a city. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so she's here to talk about living in the woods. Um, and on her left <laughs> is Phil Woolley, who's a fellow Brit. I'm not sure what he feels about the election. Um, he's a partner at Grant Thornton and he spends his life trying to help clients, including cities, extract value from their own data sets. And he's actually got some great things to talk about in terms of what cities get wrong about what they think they're really about in terms of some of the data. So he's going to be talking about that. Um, on his left is the mayor of uh, Prague, Adriana Karnachova. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> who is the, uh, has been mayor since 2014 and the first woman to serve in the position, so double kudos. Uh, previously ran her own strategic marketing company and I read that you speak seven languages, including Russian and Hungarian, but thankfully we're doing this today in English. And then Steve Levitt, a local Chicago man, professor of economics at the University of Chicago, um, co-authored a tiny book called Freakonomics, which sold a mere four million plus rising copies. How many is it up right now? Maybe five, I don't know. Maybe we, we five. We make up different numbers. It's only numbers, <laughs> you know, it's only data. Um, and his latest episode of Freakonomics is called How Stupid Is Our Obsession With Lawns? So if you want to ask him about lawns, go and find him afterwards. And finally, Carl Schramm, who um, was so excited about the panel, he overslept this morning and he barely got here in time. He was putting on his tie when he arrived. And he... <laughs> helped to build the, the Kaufman Foundation into a leading economics institution when he wasn't asleep. And he is working on a new book called Why Cities Fail and is an expert on entrepreneurship. So we have a great panel. Um, so what I'd like to start with is um, Steve Levitt. Um, it, we had a conversation the other day and it was really interesting about the role of cities and particularly the shift towards the service sector in cities and what does that mean about the, econ the, the rising economies of cities. So I wonder if we can start with you on that. Sure. Um, so when I was kind of coming of age in, as an economist, there was this general belief that cities were, were done, were failing. Maybe 25 years ago that, that cities had served their purpose and, and no longer uh, really had a, a future. And that is a classic example of how um, prediction, especially prediction by economists, is often so completely wrong. But, it, but I do think it's good to go back and think about that time. I mean, New York City was you know, on the Bay Area on the verge of bankruptcy in 1978. But something has changed, and there's no doubt that at least among the upper echelon of cities, uh, they are thriving in a way that few people might have ever anticipated um, 20 years ago. And, and I think that the data suggests that um, what cities have become, in some sense, is the playground of the rich, that the, the, the cities that are successful um, are now providing a set of services which are um, 
relatively uniquely provided in big cities, and those include services like you know baseball teams and opera. And I mean, this event would be at, at the exact top of the list of the kind of event that could only happen in a handful of big cities. Would never happen anywhere else. And these, and 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 then along with that, things like cafes and and um, and and. In the case of Chicago, you know, a beautiful lake and amenities along the lake um, that are becoming more and more important to the affluent because everything else has become so cheap. So, essentially, as the rich have gotten richer in our society, and the other things that rich people might like to consume, like electronics, um, food, um, housing, and anywhere other than the big cities. Um, are just have got, are really cheap. Are really cheap relative to the incomes of people, and so an increasing share of income is being spent on these very specialized services like yoga and and pets and things like that. That that um, that, uh, that 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 the rich are are consuming, and that is, I think, kind of this this consumption city is has become a real theme in tourism as well. We'll, we'll talk about tourism as well, um, that, that there are at least a handful of cities which have been amazingly successful, New York City in particular, many international cities, London, Chicago to a certain extent, that have thrived in this environment. Um, but in, in, in the same sense, I think we should be realistic of, of the fact that there is a, a second tier of cities that is below you know, Dubai, you know, Dubai also being in that top tier, but then there's a set of cities that are below that really, it, you know, struggle for a sense of why they exist. And, and, and in many ways, I think many cities still exist only because um, buildings and structures last for so long that um, once a city's there, people stay there um, just because the depreciation of cities happens slowly. So, so places like maybe Gary, Indiana or, or Detroit, um, you might wonder why they, they persist and have so much population as the industrial base has moved away, but in some sense it's just because there are places to be and, and cities decline much more slowly than they rise. So, so, uh, so just on the issue of uh, conspicuous consumption or rather the move to inconspicuous consumption, what does that mean for the, the shift in terms of the service economy and the job, you know, you, you've got a real divide between people consuming, you said consuming pets, so hopefully they're not consuming pets because that would be a bad thing. Um, <laughs> But what are the implications of that in terms of the service sector and lower paid jobs servicing the affluent? Yeah, so I, economically, I think what creates a certain tension is that, uh, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't necessarily call it conspicuous consumption, because I don't think people are consuming it in order to be seen and, and appreciated. It just is that the nature of when you have a lot of money, you spend it on relatively frivolous things, which are, you know, are hard to provide. But the key to most services is that they have a high, uh, a high labor input, and in general, those in generally an unskilled labor input. So it doesn't. So so take take coffee shops as a perfect example. Coffee shops have um, a lot of relatively low paid people working in them, and the tension becomes in a city that is providing amenities to the affluent. There needs to be a large um, set of providers who themselves are not affluent, at least not yet, uh, and, and the nature of a thriving city is that it's extremely expensive. Land, space, rent is extremely expensive, and it creates a tension. I lived in Palo Alto for a year, and it was a perfect example of Palo Alto. Every amenity in Palo Alto was aimed at the rich, uh, and the people, I, I would ask the people who worked in the, in the, in the shops and the restaurants, and they would commute an hour and a half each way to get there because it was so expensive to live anywhere around there. And that, that I think, is an ultimate tension that um, will take some real resolution. Great. I'd love to come back to that. Um, I think what I'd like to just add to that is there's a great data point about um, spending in, by New Yorkers. And apparently, there's a, uh, um, those who, who live in dense cities obviously spend a lot more on clothing because they have less space and that's what they want to show off about. And New Yorkers apparently have a great watch fetish. And in 2010, they spent about 27 times more on watches as a share of their expenditure than any other city in the world. So that's a pretty interesting oh, data point to your oh. consumption. I wonder if I could bring in Gerald on uh, tourism as head of the World uh, Tourism Authority. What are you seeing in terms of the kind of the importance of tourism for cities and some of the implications of that? 
Well, it is interesting what Steve talks about, and uh, particularly people working in service-related jobs. And I would say, in, in, in the larger organizations, yes, the entry-level jobs might be pretty lowly paid, but uh, I think we're, we're a great provider uh, of, uh, of these entry-level jobs. If you look in Europe, and lots of parts of Southern Europe, where upwards of 50% of people under 25 years of age are unemployed, travel and tourism gives huge opportunities. Uh, for, um, for young people to come and work. Plus the fact that a lot of these people are probably uh, college students, they can supplement their, uh, the, the, their money to at least be able to pay off their student loans and everything which they have particularly in this country. And I think that uh, what we do there is really important for cities. When you talk about the kind of consumption, and you're right, it's not conspicuous consumption, it's kind of lifestyle consumption that people just enjoy sitting on a roadside, a, a, a curbside cafe, and uh, just chatting to each other in the coffee shop, which you know, we have very much in Dubai as well, has become really popular. But um, the travel tourism industry at the moment, we have done some, a lot of research which shows that uh, we now employ directly and indirectly and support jobs of 292 million people globally, which equates to 10% of global employment. And in GDP levels, comes in at about 10% of global GDP. And this is research that's been carried out on behalf of the World Travel and Tourism Council by Oxford Economics and also the United Nations World Tourism Organization. So it is pretty uh, robust. They are pretty robust figures. How, how it, big could it become? Well, we say that it's continuing to grow. Last year, 1.2 billion people took an international journey. There were, okay, if you take five journeys, you're, that's uh, five people. 1.2 billion is colossal. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's very encouraging for the industry. And at the same time, naturally, we will have uh, challenges. I think that when you, when you look at some cities and uh, a phrase that we hear a lot about nowadays is over-tourism. Uh, Venice, for example, in 1950, there were 150,000 people living in Venice. Today, there are 55,000 people living in Venice. So we've got to understand that uh, tourism, you know, yes, it is a force for good, we believe, and naturally we would believe it, being part of the industry. But I do think that it, it, actually, it actually is a, a great force for good, a great provider of employment, a great way to get people together and people to mix. And certainly we see in a place like Dubai, where we have a huge mixing of the various cultures that come into a place like Dubai, a lot of prejudices fall away when people actually go to a country they've only heard about, rather than we were talking earlier, Steve, about how you experience a place and you come away with a totally different perspective, usually a much more positive perspective uh, on the actual destination. But we have uh, responsibilities as well. So what should cities be doing to encourage tourism, or what are the implications well, from your role? I, I think there are, there are a few points to that, obviously, but one of the things that uh, and we've seen this in Ireland uh, where Dublin is it's really hard to get a hotel room in Dublin at the moment, but the Irish Tourism Board has been extremely effective in trying to encourage visitors to actually get outside the city and see more than, than the city. On the western seaboard of Ireland, from Donegal right down to Cork, all along the Atlantic seaboard, they have created what they call the Wild Atlantic Way, which is signposted all the way along. There are guest houses, Airbnbs, there are hotels, and you can cycle it, you can walk it, you can drive it, you can come back year after year. So but they're telling people to get out of the city? They're not telling them to get out of the city. It's, it's, it's experience more than just the city. So it's not just the capital city, it's not just the global city that you should be really concerned about to, to see. You, you also need to see more as a tourist. And we, within the tourism industry, believe very strongly in this. And also the management of cities that, uh, that suffer in certain, at certain times of the year from over-tourism. I was recently in Cambodia and Phnom Penh and they were talking about Sea and Reap and uh, the Angkor Wat uh, temples, which actually were being almost overrun at one stage because they weren't being properly managed. So yes, you have to just be responsible and uh, understand their, how we have to deliver the proper product for the people who are coming. Um, Linda, I wonder if I can bring you in here about, with your United Airlines, which is obviously servicing the 1.2 billion trips, and you're obviously very pleased to hear about this. That's right. Um, I wonder if you can sort of talk about how from United Airlines perspective, how you understand the implications for cities of that kind of growth and also what you need as an airline to kind of manage the relationship with the big cities you're working with. Sure. Well, you know, at United Airlines, the uh, 87,000 employees that we have are all about connecting people. And we fly to over 300 destinations in 50 countries. 
And, uh, but we don't fly to Prague, which I learned. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, which is what it's all about. No matter where we fly, no matter where I go, we usually hear of cities that would like to have more airline connectivity. And so um, really what we're trying to figure out is where are the best places to fly, um, how often to fly, and how to best utilize our, you know, our effectively scarce assets. In cities uh, that have vibrant infrastructure, including airports and uh, airspace and, and ways to access that airspace are a really important part. So if you're looking at sort of the relationship with, uh, between an airline and a city and the sort of downtown, what, what is necessary to help make sure that you can continue to, I mean, it's obviously about connecting in the urban transport next network too. Just talk a bit about the, that relationship. Well, I think it's, it's got, it, you know, we could, we could go on and on <laughs> about that relationship. I think it's unique based on the city that, that is there. It's based on whether it's a hub for us, whether it's a, a, a city that we're already present in or one that we would want to fly more to, but it's really understanding what the growth prospects are in that city, uh, both the tourism piece of that prospect and the, and the business piece of that prospect. Is it a seasonal um, uh, transportation area or is it a more year-round transportation area? All are factors in how we figure out where to fly. And Phil, I wonder if you can bring you in and tell us some of what you've been doing with cities, particularly in the UK. Um, and you're trying to help them understand their economics better. And you said that you started this project three years ago, and you've seen that cities often arrive with an assumption about what's making the money, but yeah. you're helping to show them that it's, they're completely wrong. So I wonder if you can just talk, talk about some of that misperceptions about what we think cities are really generating. Yeah, so my, my team, uh, what we've been doing over the last three years or so, is trying to build combined data sets that give cities a, a, a more accurate view and a balanced view of their, of their economy. And what, and what we found is quite often that city leaders don't have that view around what really is the sort of functional economic role of their place or their city. So in a large city, uh, that could mean uh, not really understanding patterns of economic activity over the city. And I think um, one of the other aspects, certainly, um, the large uh, gl global cities within the UK would have very limited understanding of the wider regional impacts of, of, the, of their economic growth or activity. Um, so uh, what we've tried to do is really work with city leaders to give them that sort of balanced view around the sort of people living uh, within their city, their economic performance, but also then the, the, the sort of infrastructure uh, factors. So what are, what are some of the lessons so far? Um, so, so the lessons really are, you know, in a UK context, we've identified nine key growth corridors. Um, and if you spoke to a range of cities or places and looked at their economic strategies, by and large, they all say the same thing. And not everyone can do the same thing. And not everyone can fulfill the same role and go after what, the what same. What is the thing that they all think that they should be doing? So they would all say, we want to grow at a growth rate of X percent above the national average. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, at, at a place in the Midlands in the UK, the North Midlands, um, would not really talk about their functional role in the context of Manchester, Birmingham, or London. They'd talk uh, about their own economic aspirations and the fact that they want to be a cultural centre and do all the sorts of things that Steve's talked about, which is, you know, in, in, in some cases, not really a realistic aspiration. What's, so what's a so I, I spoke to it. So a good, a good example would be a city in the northeast uh, that said to me, we know, when we're, we know we'll be successful when we have a Starbucks on the high street. So, so we, have a, we have a range of sort of economic indicators that we look at, but also more sort of qualitative indicators. The number of yoga instructors is one that we haven't had in there yet, uh, but is something that we might well add in because I think that sort of... Uh, and how, how many of the cities is, on that list of things that they think they want to be yeah. have tech? You know, they all want to have a tech cluster. They all want to yes. be sort of... Silicon, Fen, or whatever it is. We have so many different names for it around the world. How, how far is sort of tech something that everyone thinks is, should be the go-to narrative for their city? And how wrong is that? Um, I mean, what, what we found around tech clusters, and we did, we did an exercise with the European Commission where we mapped uh, tech clusters in 20 uh, different member states. Um, and, and, and quite often there wasn't unifying factors as to why tech clusters had grown up in those specific places. Um, one, one thing we can sort of say for certain is some of the sort of infrastructure investment that had gone in in particular places um, 
to try and support a tech cluster had not been effective because quite often these things come through as sort of organic growth around universities and all the rest of it. So, you know, trying to, I don't, I don't want to sort of criticise my hometown, but um, trying to build Silicon Valley in Stoke on Trent is, uh, is not perhaps, you know, uh, ever sort of going to pay off. So, have you told them that? Did they uh, know that yet? Well, if they're watching this, they might have, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. so anyone from Stoke on Trent, yeah, you know, keep, keep this between Keep to the pottery yeah. or something. Uh, um, so, <laughs> Adriana, I wonder if you can, this is obviously a good topic for you because you have committed the city to a big, ambitious tech program in your uh, initiative for Prague 2030. I wonder if you can talk about why you've done that and what you think that will deliver. Well, I mean, everybody said it already, that it's extremely difficult to manage a city without the knowledge, without the data, what's going on. And that's why three years ago, when I came to the office, so we decided to establish a program which is called SMART. It's a buzzword, it's, it's circulating through, the, through, through Europe, through the, the, through the world. But we, we didn't want it to invent a wheel, so we actually looked around who is doing what and uh, how can we utilize the knowledge around. Uh, we created a special company that dedicated this, uh, this program to this company. And uh, actually they are in charge to develop a data platform and that's why we are here in Chicago because uh, it's our sister city and they are very advanced here in analyzing data and utilizing it for the management and planning of the city. So this is what we, with what we did, and uh, we are at the beginning, but uh, when I took over the office, I, so I was so, uh, I wondered that how can be a city managed without the knowledge of data? And you know it from the private sector, so I mean, uh, it, was, it was a miracle because the data um, uh, are spread around in various uh, branches of the office, of the, of the municipal office, in companies which are owned by the office, but they are not, somehow get it together and there is no uh, analytic, there was no analytic tool to, to dig out the nece necessary data for decision making. So, and we, we changed this uh, and of course uh, there are a lot of challenges which are facing Prague and we are the fastest growing city in the sea region. How fast uh, is that? What does that mean? Uh, it is uh, 3.5 in 15, 15 years we tripled our our growth, we are contributing by 28% to the national GDP, that's the economic, cultural, whatsoever center. We have 44 universities, we are working with universities, so it's, a, it's really a hub for, let's say, uh, starting to be a hub for R&D in, in central, central uh, So talk me, talk me through what Prague will look like in 2030, if all the ambitious ideas, are we going to be met at the airport by robots? in uh, driving autonomous cars, what, are, what is it going to feel like? What is the ambition for the city? Well, not by robots maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> however, it was invented anyway by Karl Chapek, who was uh, creating this, uh, this word, and it was, he was Czech. Um, <laughs> don't, wo don't worry, we are not spreading You can about. create a robot museum around him then. Uh, excuse me? You can create a robot museum around uh, him. No, no, not directly. This is not our ambition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stick to the moderating. <laughs> Okay, no, no, our ambition by 2030 is, um, 2030 is to uh, have five pillars, which is, um, uh, first of all, is traffic, because this is a big challenge, I mean, how to keep it clean or, or transform it into clean traffic by electromobility, by finding clever way how to finding a parking lot. By the way, we are thinking, we're thinking whether the increase of the divorce rate has something to do with the lack of parking lots. <laughs> Can be. <laughs> That's Why a not? topic for freaking. Yeah, it's a topic for you, but I mean, the data will show us because we have a tremendously Is that high park? divorce rate. <laughs> And uh, of course, we, energy saving is also a big topic for the city. And then tourism, you mentioned already, we have seven, more than 7.3 million tourists a year. And they are concentrated in the very center because they are want to see the Charles Bridge and the castle. But there are so many other places uh, worth to see in Prague. So at the moment, at this company, I was talking about we are creating an application just to spread them around with gamification. And we find a way how to show them other parts of Prague by uh, crediting them when they are finding some special, let's say, fountain. 
uh, and uh, hopefully be, it, it's working out because it's overloaded. Prague center is overloaded by, by tourists and they are coming every day in the year. There is no season, there is no special season, and it's good they are coming because we are living out of tourism, mainly from, uh, it's the biggest income from tourism, but still we have to work uh, with, with uh, how, to, how to manage the tourists, yeah. and the data platform will show us how. Great, I want to bring in uh, Carl. Um, obviously you've written a lot about the role of entrepreneurship in cities and in growth. And uh, one of you, and I know you've been looking at that recently in terms of different cities in America now are surprisingly effective in terms of the, the fastest growth of small companies. So it's in, in, in Orlando and different cities rather than some of the mainstream cities. What if you can just sort of give us some perspective on the research around entrepreneurship? Well, I begin by saying, you know, when I left uh, with my PhD, which was the generation before Steve, um, I was equally impressed by how wrong economists were about predictions. When I left school, uh, the world population would bust through some hypothetical ceiling within the next five years. India couldn't support itself. There would be mass starvation. This was a consensus. You can go back and read foreign affairs. You can read science. This was a consensus that there would be huge global political turmoil. And within 10 years, of course, India was exporting food. Now, this is really an important view about this because I think when I look at cities, there are all kinds of predictions, and I think it's one of our phenomena, not just economists, but economists are extra guilty of this, that when you make a statistical observation, the next step is, okay, smart guy, what's the solution? And when it comes to cities, there are two things that I see. One is just like what Steve said, there are completely uh, stratified cities now. Some are growing like crazy but many are failing. And one of our great failures as intellectuals is we have no theory about what to do about cities in the future. And we don't have any theory about how, how you deal with failing cities. And failing cities are much more common than prospering cities. Uh, and why I say that is we have a consensus that everybody's rushing to the city, and it's not really clear. There is no doubt a, a macro trend in that direction, but it could reverse tomorrow. And there's lots to suggest, because Linda's building a house in the prairies, that it goes on. Woods, woods. Right? Woods. Or woods. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it goes on. And these are the unpredictable phenomena that, that Steve writes about. So just to make an observation, if you have a failing cities on your, a city on your hands and you ask someone to come, they have four or five prescriptions, and everybody in this room knows them. First of all, you have to put in light rail. Right? So I've been in cities with 150,000 people with empty highways, and the mayor is committed to light rail, okay? Second thing is you have to have sustainable development, redevelopment, and that comes in two, two versions. You have to take your old brick factory buildings and, and make them into high-rent housing. And second, uh, there's a city I could, I, I've been to which is convinced that if it builds five triple super platinum leads titanium buildings, it will become its own tourist event. People will come see uh, sustainable buildings, self-sustaining buildings. Third, of course, is uh, tech, and everybody has to have tech, but it's already been observed. The Silicon Valley has been explicitly attempted as a copy in 400 cities, and it's never worked any place. Uh, the fifth, of course, is in my zone, which is entrepreneurship. So everybody's going to be entrepreneurial. We're going to have entrepreneurial incubators, and they're all over the place. And the reality is that we have built, we now have about 6,000 people teaching entrepreneurship at the university level in the United States. We have more venture money sloshing around than ever. We've gone from 12 in 1990 incubators to now 1,400 incubators in the United States. And the rate of new business formation in cities and every place else is 60% of what it was 10 years ago. So this formula doesn't work. And one of the last things, which is really sort of meant as a joke, but it's a tragic joke, is the fifth thing is everybody thinks we have to build an art district. And I always think that this is pathetic in the sense that, you know, we all flock to Prague to see what rich people hired artists to do. It was the wealth came first, the economy came first, and then the arts came along behind it. Now if you talk to mayors, they say, oh, well, we're going to build an arts district. Uh, there's a small town. Uh, famous because it has some role in aviation, Elmira, New York, um, uh, where I think, uh, I don't know, Curtis, I think, worked on his motorcycle engines that became Curtis Wright. But anyway, um, you know, they have built an art district. Uh, 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 there is a season to art districts in, in Elmira. It's zero. 
Okay, but their 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 vision is that uh, if they build an art district, the city will flourish, and it's not going to happen. Okay, so you've put out five things which are failing, and then you said at the beginning that a we shouldn't listen to economists, and b people don't have theories about how to improve this. So give us some examples of what could improve failing cities. Uh, I'm not sure there's much that can improve failing cities, and uh, Linda's responsible for this. Um, because uh, there are three or four reasons cities fail, but the biggest one, I suspect Steve would agree with me, is our labor markets have shifted so radically that we agglomerate talent in certain places. Dubai is an, accl an agglomerator of talent. And if you take a city, let's say Cincinnati, the smartest kid in Cincinnati, if he's got a choice between Dubai and Cincinnati, or Palo Alto and Cincinnati, or San Francisco, or Denver, or maybe Austin, Texas, is going to go where other smart people are. And it's made easier because the airline industry makes travel virtually free. Information, communications, calling back to your mother. You know, when I was in graduate school, it was after 6 o'clock on Sunday for three minutes, right? Now I can Skype, you know, my kids nonstop. They won't stop. Um, and uh, th these are the phenomena that are making it happen. So I think in many ways, and that, by the way, is also to suggest that if you look at cities, there are sign curves. So cities run out of gas, and then some cities come back. In my lifetime, as Steve pointed out, New York ran out of gas. San Francisco has come back. San Diego has come back hugely. Boston has come back from a very slow uh, uh, period of time when it was shrinking. So, uh, you know, there, there's hope. But uh, like so many things in economics, we can't really forecast, if we're honest, what the factors are. Um, so there was a conversation there about Dubai and attracting talent. I wonder if you can kind of, given your 18 years in Dubai, comment <laughs> on what you've... 30 years 30 in years Dubai. in Dubai. <laughs> and what you've seen yeah. over that period of time in terms of a rapid growth in the city. Yes, I mean, in Dubai we've had some incredible growth. I mean, there's a photograph there of uh, Dubai in 1980, <laughs> and that's called the Sheikh Zayed Road. And um, if, if you look at where we were then in terms of uh, tourism and travelers were just maybe 100,000, maybe the population was about the same. And uh, now today, when we look at Dubai, we're, this is the same road, same place. Uh, we're up to, um, we have 15 million visitors a year uh, into, into Dubai. The airport has surpassed Heathrow as the uh, busiest international airport for international passengers at 83 million passengers a year. And uh, so much of this has been done because of the, the, the leadership, and I still think leadership can transform cities and will continue to do it, and that's, New York is probably a, a case in point there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's basically what we've uh, enjoyed in Dubai mm -hmm. over the years is hugely ambitious leadership, even now, just before I left, there was a report in the local newspaper that there are 26,000 buildings, including houses, under construction in Dubai. And we all said, wow, we've done this before, and now here we go again. And I witnessed the opening of the, of the Hyatt, actually, in Dubai in 1981. I was working on a, on a hotel there at the airport at the time. And uh, the sales director for the hotel said, now we have enough hotels in Dubai, we mustn't open anymore, we have seven hotels. Well, today we have 700 hotels, so if anybody had listened to that, and you're right about the economics, the economics don't add up, and there is very much build it and they will come. Dubai port, the Jebel Ali port, is the, was the largest man-made port in the world, but they were building that in 1978. And I drove down through the, through, through the basin of the port at that time and uh, asked the same question, what's this for? And today it's the fifth busiest uh, container port in the world. And through acquisitions, etc., Dubai Ports World actually runs about 120 ports worldwide. So uh, ambition, but leadership is so important what, for what, driving it forward. What was interesting is one thing you said to me is it's run um, like a business. So the city is run like a business. I'd be interested in your take on what well, that means. Well, I, I, we were discussing yesterday as well in the workshop about all this, about uh, everybody says, oh, you know, Singapore is the example of a great uh, international city. But Singapore in many ways and Dubai have a lot of similarities. Uh, 
you know, you, you have very much a, a, a political system that's set up there that is, is not a parliamentary system like you would have here. So it's easier, yes, to get things done. But we do have planning processes and planning procedures. And uh, I, I think that in, in terms of is it run like a business world from the point of view that return on investment is expected and uh, projects are not taken on with the view that uh, well, they'll be supplemented by the government. Uh, we, we know, and uh, I know that United Airlines are particularly sensitive about it, but if you look at uh, Emirates Airlines in particular, Emirates Airlines was set up in 1985 with two leased aircraft, and now they've got about 320 aircraft. But they actually pay dividends to the government, as opposed to the government subsidizing them. And that is fact. I mean, it's been, they, they produce their, uh, their, their annual results every year signed off by PwC. So Jeremy Corbyn might be right about nationalizing lots of industries again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder if I, bring, I wonder if you can bring you and Phil. Um, yeah, so ju just building on that um, sort of theme of, of running a city like a business, you know, a, a, a strong example of a successful city in that regard in the UK would be Ma Manchester, where I live. Um, where they pursued a sort of twin track approach around uh, aspirations around economic growth and to grow this, uh, to, uh, narrow the sort of fiscal gap between government support and revenue contributions that, that the city would make to the, the treasury uh, and the public sector reform programs uh, to, to enable them to deliver that. Uh, and, and around that, they built a framework, framework and investment model uh, a strategic investment fund that operate on a very commercial basis with um, a, a single assessment framework for projects which consider financial and economic returns, um, payback re returns to government and local authorities and, as investors. So Manchester Airport, for example, is owned by all the greater Manchester local authorities. Um, and uh, they've taken a very strategic and uh, f focused approach to that with very stable leadership within the city. Um, and, uh, and that has been uh, successful and a number of the surrounding areas have, be have benefited from, uh, fr from that approach too. I wonder if I can bring in Linda first and then Steve. So Linda, thinking about running a business, running a city as a business, you're obviously a CIO of a very big company. <laughs> what, does it, do you think all cities should introduce their own CIO? Well, you know, if you think about it, I'm the technology practitioner. I'm the last person in this panel to talk about technology, actually, which is a good thing, because it really is absolutely transforming how businesses, cities, uh, even tourists, in terms of how they use information, is changing. So, you know, I think cities, whether they call it a CIO or they, they you must have uh, technology expertise to be able to understand uh, the things that are changing. And then, with all of this data and all the things we, that you talked about, about historically making bad decisions, it's, it's really uh, easy when you're looking at a lot of information to think you must have all the information and therefore can make the right decision. But it actually, we were talking about this earlier, sometimes it gets harder when you have, when you have more data. And so analytics and driving insights uh, is, a, is a pretty important skill set. And having a technology leader at the table where decisions are being made, I think, is critical. Um, Steve, we talked about big data in the green room. Um, I wonder if you can just comment on that and then go back to what we were saying before. Yeah, so I would say, um, <clears throat> well, so I, I, am, I am somewhat of a big data skeptic. I, I absolutely love and live and, and thrive on data. But I think there is a myth out there that, that data by itself provides answers. But I actually think the greatest shortcoming that we have in terms of talent right now is people who can sensibly analyze data. And I, and I think the problem stems from the fact that we haven't figured out ways to teach people to be sensible data scientists. So there's no, there's no classes I can take at the University of Chicago which will train me to actually be good at going out in the world and, and having a mix of skills which allow me to um, access databases and then program and then think about answers. And, and so, um, the economy turned out to be very good at um, generating computers, computer scientists, so programmers. So programmers, we're very efficient at generating programmers. We haven't yet figured out how to generate data scientists. So I think, I think it's easy to say, and I agree that cities should use information effectively, but what I have found repeatedly, whether it's uh, in, in cities or in companies, is that the lack of talent for translating data into insights is the stumbling block that we, we hit. But I want to go back. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but you gave an example of about sort of of all the massive data sets. It's actually asking, 
interrogating a very narrow slice, which is what matters. It's not. Yeah, in the, in the end, I have found in my own, you know, whenever I've been able to come up with what I think are insights, the insights, you know, if I have a, a database that's, you know, 50 terabytes, in the end, the, the, the set of data that I actually use to get the insight is usually one, one millionth of that. It's a very focused laser, you know, what am I call it, accidental or natural experiment that occurred that, that allows me to get a causality. I mean, I think the key is that insights and, 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 um, and public policy all depend on causality. And big data, data in general, are about correlation. Um, without some kind of what an economist calls some kind of an exogenous shock or some, something which allows you to separate causality from mere correlation, it is hard to develop good insights. Um, I wanted to go back to the question of running cities like companies, <laughs> and I think I'm actually somewhat skeptical about that idea as well, because I think, I mean, what, like, what I'm taking away from this panel is that... It's gloom. Uh, all. <laughs> <laughs> that um, look, there are two. There are two things cities do. Cities in try to pro efficiently provide a set of needed services to people who live in those cities. And in that sense, uh, running that part of the city as a business makes a lot of sense because it's you know if you think of businesses being efficient and and um, customer focused and whatnot, that makes sense. But the other thing that I'm hearing from everyone and from, uh, is uh, you know, Dubai is, you know, Dubai and Prague are very special places. And there are uh, thousands of cities that are not very special. And, and to be special, you need, like I even think of Chicago and, or, or, or Boston and the big dig when, when Boston did the big dig or the incredible, the crazy, you know, investments in ports or what Chicago did to bury the railroads, et cetera. These are things that when, when, the, when the visionary leaders say them, they make absolutely no sense to regular people like me. And you think, this has got to be a failure. This has got to be a waste of money. And those are the kinds of things that companies would and should never do because they have payoffs. So the building of castles, I mean, these things have, have and, and fancy bridges, have payoffs that are coming hundreds of years later when businesses have focuses which are one quarter, two quarter, three quarters. And so I think it's very important that um, the cities that will succeed or fail, you know, fail brilliantly with their art districts and whatever, building the, the fancy buildings, uh, are, are categorically not behaving like businesses for better or for worse. Carl, I wonder if I can bring you in on this. So what, what, is, what have you seen in terms of your research around the role of business, big businesses in cities, which is proving successful? Well, it's a very interesting uh, theory in the sense that once upon a time in our cities, uh, big businesses were in cities. If you think about America, um, cities all had a role to make the national economy. So you could go city by city by city and say that's why that city exists. Toledo made scales, Rochester made cameras, Buffalo ground wheat, uh, Cincinnati made electrical equipment, as did Milwaukee. You could go bang, bang, bang. This city was all about trading lumber to get started. Uh, and then it became a great railroad hub, uh, as, as did St. Louis. Um, and you know, the, the, you could point to the companies. You can go right down Michigan Avenue and see the relics of these great companies. With globalization, it's very hard to seat a company anymore. You know, they are really global companies. And it's, it's difficult. Uh, lots of public relations goes into saying, you know, um, to pick on a company that, you know, United is a Chicago company, which it is, but United is a world company. Its customers are all over the place. It has employees here, but it has employees all over the place as well. It's actually hard to settle this consciousness. Now, this shift has been an enormous uh, parallel with the shift, and here's the good news about what cities could do if they can pull it off. Uh, our failing cities are clearly related to essentially the evacuation of the ability to make local policy to Washington. And we've watched this happen really since the 1940s. The ability to sort of run a democracy at the city level is largely attenuated in the United States. And part of that is a parallel move to the internationalization and nationalization of our companies. Uh, economic policy is made way upstairs in the United States anymore. And now the contest is whether or not uh, nation states will even control their economic policy. 
I, I think that's sort of what, part of what explains what's going on in England these days. Um, and so in a sense, it's an issue, uh, and it goes to the point of the last question about uh, are they companies or are they governments? And in a sense, they're not governments anymore. They're in this sort of wasteland in between because much of the local determination is all settled upstairs. In an American city, transport, healthcare, uh, schooling, um, and um, um, something else I'm blanking on are basically all decided at the federal level. What about, I mean, um, the role of kind of really big global companies, obviously, I'm going to name a few in terms of they're having probably some of the biggest impact on cities around the world, which is obviously Airbnb and Uber. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are complete, I mean, there was a great example in the UK recently when Uber actually paid a property developer to pay every single person in a new building, a luxury building, 100 pounds of free Uber a month um, to uh, give up a parking space in this new development. So obviously it saved the money for the luxury development, but that has a long-term implication for you know, the city in terms of those kinds of interventions over time. And as more public companies, you know, non-public companies like Uber take over more of the kind of transit networks of, of cities, there's going to be a problem. So let's say in 10 years' time they say, well, actually, we're no, it's no longer economic to provide Uber in one city, or we, want to, we, we no longer have public transportation because they've gone away, and Uber can raise the prices. So there's lots of, there are lots of long-term implications from cities making short-term decisions about well, Uber is great, we'll just rely on Uber. Um, I'd just love both of you, or people on the panel, to comment on that, and I know you want to comment on Airbnb and the implications. But the role of Uber and cities and how that's reframing um, the city is an interesting subject. Well, I'll be real brief about it. You, again, you can't even predict this, but you know, just, just to throw a scenario out there, could it be that in 25 years we shut down the, the subways in New York? Uh, you know, um, there are forecasts that say that we could move people around with a five minute delay from how they can move right now with taxi cabs, private cars, and subway in New York with one-eighth the number of cars. Imagine we can pull that off. What, what does it do to the, the yeah. texture of a city? I wonder if I can bring in the Mayor of Prague in terms of your, going back to your vision of 2030, and how far ahead are you planning to 2050 if you're thinking as Mayor of Prague right now and what the city should look like? I can't forecast what's happening in 2050 because I'm happy that I have a vision in 2030. But coming back, to, but coming back to, to running the city as a business, I think uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is not coming true because simply, uh, as you said, I mean, the, the role of the city is provide uh, services and then, of course, also security and safety for the citizens. And this is nowadays go going to be much more important than uh, any, anything else. Uh, and, uh, of course, I mean, in terms of effectiveness, if you want to run the city effectively as a business, it's okay. But uh, the question is whether we are still in the European Union, then the effectiveness is a little bit a uh, question. So, um, well, but definitely you can't hire and fire people like you want in a business. I mean, you are, have people working for the municipality, they are protected by law. You can't fire and hire them. And it's for a certain reason, yeah, because it's not a business. So with the collaboration with businesses for in the cities are extremely important, of course. I mean, this is, this is ample, especially in tourism or whatsoever business it is. And the city is not here to make business, but it should find a way how to make business with the businesses, transparently, openly, and, and reliably. And this is the way how cities who are not that successful can figure out how they could be successful by working with businesses and not be afraid, but uh, in the past there were several projects which are uh, were a failure, of course, but there is a way. We are starting to build a metro line with the business as an investment, uh, creating an investment company together with the, with the businesses and we will see how it works out. But this is the way how to maybe find um, sources also for, for projects which are not automatically and Im immediately uh, uh, not possible to s support from the uh, from, the, from the budget of the city. And this is the way in the future. Um, I'm going to go to a few questions from the audience. Um, the first of which is, how would cities cope with the changing nature of work, uh, such as shorter working weeks, universal basic income, and lifelong learning? I wonder if anyone wants to pick up on any of those issues. That's not a topic for us. 
Well, I think those are the exact kind of phenomena that make cities attractive because in a, in a world in which you want to learn and you have a lot of leisure, cities are absolutely the place to be. Um, and I think that has been at the heart of the rejuvenation of cities. And, um, you know, and I think that it was, again, going back 30 years, it's unthinkable that retirees would be moving back to, to inner cities. But I think that's actually a phenomenon that's going on um, in, in, of course, in this elite tier of cities that we're talking about. Um, Does anyone have yeah, We have 44 universities based in, uh, uh, in Prague. Uh, we, as Prague, are establishing 270 uh, secondary schools, that's, I mean, high schools. So, uh, and, and there is a program to, to um, attract uh, education for elderly people. So just involve, uh, in, I mean, make them interested to, to be educated as, uh, let's say, the third pillar of their, of their education, the fourth pillar, and, and uh, maybe to bring them back to, to life, I mean, to, 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 as a normal working, working force. Because uh, everybody is facing that we are growing older, and the people are living in the city, so what to do with them? Either provide services to, uh, for the elderly people, it's natural what we are doing, but besides uh, this service, what we are providing, how can we attract them into normal city life? So this is a challenge, of course, um, for us. I want to give a bit, unpack that question a bit about the changing nature of work and back to what we talked about at the beginning, um, which we never really got onto the policy side about the, if we have a rise of services, for a cultural elite in the cities and a growing disconnect, what should cities be thinking about? How do they handle that kind of tension? What should they be doing? I would like a, a view from Stephen. Carl. I'm going to defer that question to you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I, I have no good answer. It's a problem. I, 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 again, I, I'd sort of just fall back and say it's almost impossible to sort of foresee this. I began life as a labor economist. And uh, as you can see, my basic theory is basically about where people are going to work and what they're going to do. I think it's very foreseeable, with all the caveats that nobody really knows, um, that we don't need all, all, all the people who need to work work. That is, they need jobs, but we don't have jobs for them. In, in one scenario, I emphasize about the future, what do we do about that? Um, well, I think a lot of people throw their hands up and say, OK, so this is a favorite uh, uh, bromide now out of the Silicon Valley, okay, all the people who are now gajillionaires think that the rest of this sort of messy people who are lots dopier, who aren't geniuses and can't make a million, a billion dollars before they're 30, ought to be sort of vaguely sustained um, with a, a minimum income. Uh, the sort of messy half of what's not said there is they're not smart enough to do much, okay? I think that's a terribly gloomy view about what humankind is about. And my view is, you know, from the entrepreneurial perspective is, so much of this is random, as, as Steve knows. We, why don't we have, instead of 700,000 businesses starting every year in the United States, why don't we have a million and a half? Why don't we have four million? And one of the reasons goes to human creativity. That seems to be one of the resources we can't run out of. But you have to prepare people to be creative, and you have to prepare people to be imaginative, and you have to have economic stimuli up there that cause people to be ambitious but about there, what is, they change. But is there a tension between a city leader who's supposed to be looking modern by introducing tech and talking about big data and artificial intelligence, and actually the implications of that in terms of destroying potential jobs in their own cities? You know, what is the responsibility of a leader to tell some of those people that their job is going to be within five years you know, gone. No one ever goes to the lorry drivers and say, I'm really sorry, I'm going to be killing your jobs. No one seems to be taking responsibility for some of the implications of the embrace of tech by cities. I wonder if anyone wants to jump in on that. Phil. Thanks. <laughs> we um, just, don't worry. <laughs> I um, support you. <laughs> I, I think in terms of the, the, you know, the use of tech and, um, and, and big data within uh, public services. Um, I'd, I'd slightly disagree with Steve um, around the, the value of some of that da data. Whilst you can't always establish ca causality um, uh, through looking at the, the different range of data sets, I, th I think through our experience and also colleagues in our, our US firm, 
because of the consistency in data sets and public service data sets, it is quite, um, it, it's quite possible to establish really interesting lines of inquiry for leaders uh, to then test their strategies and, 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 and pursue things um, and, and pursue ser service interventions through that. So an example would be, uh, you know, a, t a typical anecdote within the UK would be you can't get good educational outcomes in deprived areas. Uh, actually, when you start to triangulate different um, s uh, uh, data sets across the whole system, you will see uh, examples of, of where that is done, and then you can pursue a line of inquiry to say, okay, why are they successful, why are they not successful? Um, in terms of the, 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 the loss of jobs through tech, the, the changing nature of work, et cetera, the, the point I would make on that is that um, it's the private sector driving that change, uh, and quite often our they are, the private sector is, is completely agnostic about the pressure that that puts on public services. Um, so people taking low paid jobs, not being able to afford to live within the city, so traveling significant <coughs> distances on high cost transport, et cetera, et cetera, puts public services under significant pressure uh, and the funding doesn't find its way from the private sector into public services to support that. Um, so from my experience, that, that, that's, that's, that's the key point for me. And I think generally from you know, this conference, there has been a little bit of an absence around, well, what is the contribution of the private sector to ensuring there's a sort of balanced economy uh, and easing some of these flows and tensions that are, are coming up through disparities in economic growth? I'd just like to give an example of uh, an initiative to make a city a, a good place to come to for people that particularly um, there's a, a program called the uh, Dubai Future Accelerator. And uh, this has been highly successful in Dubai where they invite startups from outside the country to apply to come into uh, Dubai. They will actually pay their airfare, they'll put them up if they, if they agree with the, uh, with the project. They'll put them up for 65 days, they give them the office space, and then there are a number of private sector sponsors who are interested in the particular startup they mentor them, they work with them all the way through the, uh, the, the, the period, the 65 days as they are there, and then take a view towards the end whether or not that particular company would like to invest in the startup and help the startup to, uh, to really set up in Dubai uh, with, uh, with their new business, which I think is a very imaginative and a good way for, uh, for a city like Dubai to get uh, people coming in with, the, with their creative um, expertise. Um, I'm just going to go briefly back to the leadership and tech point. I think there's a great example about a leadership of someone coming out against tech, uh, which was in 1589, when Queen Elizabeth I apparently refused to grant a patent to William Lee for his invention of the stocking frame knitting machine, which was speed up production of the wool. And apparently she said, thou aimest high, Master Lee, consider thou what the invention could do to my poor subjects it would assuredly bring them ruined by depriving them of employment, this and making them beggars. So perhaps Elizabeth I <laughs> has something to share for mayors of the world. Mm. I'm gonna to go to another question from the audience. Uh, how do cities fund the conditions for inclusive growth? Pretty challenging question. Stumped the audience. Fund? 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 How do cities fund the conditions for inclusive growth? So, brave man. If, well, um, so, in my experience, and using the Manchester example again, um, I uh, what, what seems to have been successful in the UK is a twin track approach of public sector reform. Uh, very targeted around the needs of the local economy and the needs of economic growth, uh, and then the application of some form of strategic investment fund that can then fund uh, those, those priority projects that are going to support that inclusive growth. Um, and often that has come through a really effective partnership between the public and the private sector with key large private sector investors and stakeholders in a particular city taking a leading role in the formation of that policy and the formation of those, the, those interventions. So uh, for me, that, that collaboration is key. All right, I'm gonna ask some personal questions. We've got two and a half minutes at the end. I'd love to know which city you'd live in if you weren't living in the city you're living in. 
which is your other preferred city. So, Steve, you're in Chicago. Where would you live if you weren't in Chicago? Um, to be honest, my favorite city in the world is Princeton, New Jersey, if that can qualify as a city, because it is, um, it does an amazing job of providing um, the sorts of amenities I like, uh, along with proximity to other things. But, um, but in some sense, it's very uncity like but, um, but, but with city-like amenities. That's fine. Carl? Uh, I think um, I, I, I had the fortune to listen to Steve, so I could, could contemplate this answer. My reflex answer is Rome. But if I was to answer Steve's way, uh, albeit it doesn't have a university, it'd probably be Delray Beach, Florida. It's the most convenient place I have ever lived in my life. Okay, Everything is there. Great. OK. Adriana. Well, I desperately felt in love with Prague, so it's very difficult to, to have another option. But um, You can, say, you can I, please run by yes. saying Chicago. Yes. Yes. That will be one option. The second option, Berlin. And why? Just... Because my German origin. Also, I was, I, left in, uh, I, I was living in Berlin a couple of years ago, and um, well, because um, I simply love it. I don't know. Love doesn't explain very much. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a great point about cities. We think it's it is. all about data, but it's actually about a feeling. Um, Phil? So my favorite city in the world is Manchester, but if, if I couldn't live in Manchester, I'm going to be a real suck up and say, I might, actually, I might live in Chicago. That'd be oh. great. Hey. Not fun. There we go. I told them I'd be proud. Please don't. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I like any city that has a great airport. <laughs> <laughs> some, of, some of my favorites are Chicago, Houston, Newark, Denver, San Francisco. You can't and name every single place. That Those are my favorites. Operates. No, I can't pick between them. I love okay. them all. Great. <laughs> Well, I even brought a photograph along of uh, is it, is it Dubai. Here? Yeah, it should be coming up for Galway, <laughs> uh, the city I grew up in. And um, uh, the photograph, they had it just like, there we go. And uh, I think it's a great city in that they've developed a lot of industry. Uh, Apple is actually building, and it's not just because of taxes, because the amazing talent of the Irish people, you know, who live there. But uh, they're, they're, no, they're, they're building their data center for Europe in Galway which will be an 850 million euro investment, which is quite significant. But all the factories in Galway have been built on the east side, which is away from the beautiful river, which I just saw there with the cathedral in the background. So I used to row on the river, and I still row when I go back to Galway. And it's so nice to be able to just to enjoy the same exact river that I rode um, uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago even today. So Galway would be my opinion. Thank what you, about you Which is yours? Chicago. I lived here for three years, and I'd live here again. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I just want to um, ask the audience to uh, applaud. That we've been, it's been a great panel. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well done.